Welcome to Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries in Education, a podcast that focuses on what is happening in education today, connecting everyone to the movers and shakers that are breaking boundaries in the education arena. Hello, this is Jamie from Linked Up Breaking Boundaries in Education. And today we have a guest of ours alongside Jerry. So they get to be in person together. That's fun. Oh, absolutely. We both found out we were going to be in Chicago at the same hotel attending the same conference. And so we decided why not just get together and do the podcast together. So this is only the second time in almost 50 podcasts that we've I've had a buddy beside me. So yes, we're very excited. So today we have Diane Dorsch. I call her Di all the time, but it's Diane Dorsch and Dwayne McClary with us. And we are so excited to have them. Um, Both of them are personal friends of mine, but they are also both doing great work nationally to try and cross that digital divide. And so I'm very honored to have both of them on the show today and excited about the work that they are doing. So Diane, we're gonna start with you if you'll just introduce yourself and tell us what you're doing and then we'll hand it off to Dwayne. I am Diane Dersch. I'm the Director of Technology for the Verizon Innovative Learning Schools Project. Now you might say she works for Verizon. I don't, I actually work for Digital Promise um, with Dwayne uh, and, and Verizon hires Digital Promise and the VILS team, Verizon Innovative Learning Schools to do their work uh, with providing LTE enabled uh, devices to students in under-resourced um, school districts. So I'm mm-hmm. so happy to be here today and I wanna pass the ball over to Dwayne. Hi, Diane, hi, Jerry. Hi, Jamie. Nice to be here. I wish I was there beside Jerry. Cause... <laughs> and you, Diane. Um, but I've known Jerry, oh my goodness, for a long time. Uh, yeah. So my name is Dwayne McClary. I am the director of the League of Innovative Schools. Uh, Digital Promise League of Innovative Schools is a national network uh, that connects and supports the most forward-thinking school district leaders in education. Uh, The league represents 114 districts in 34 states, and we serve a little over 3.4 million students. Um, And we were started, uh, uh, the League of Innovative School was launched out of the White House under President Obama within the Department of Education. And we are 10 years old this year. It is so exciting uh, to talk about that. And uh, so we're super excited to be here and and share our expertise, but also uh, chat with our good friends from, from ClassLink. Absolutely. And I was at the White House when President Obama rolled that out. And yesterday, I went to see the President and First Lady's portraits at the gallery here in Chicago. So it was very exciting. And it's hard to believe it's been 10 years. But I have a question here. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused. So Diane, you're talking about helping students that need resources. And Dwayne is talking about the most innovative schools in the United States. So are those also needy schools or not necessarily? That's a really (laughs) good point. You know, a lot of times when you don't have resource, you have to be creative. That is true, yes. And so Dwayne would say that we cross over. Um, There are some school districts that we share um, in that they're part of the league but then also we provide some resources for them. And so, and some innovation as well. Yes, wow, that's great. So when you talk about innovation, what are we talking about? What kinds of things are we looking at? Well, go ahead. Yes, Um, for us, innovation is a lot of times in the thinking part. Mm -hmm. Um, because when we work with school districts and remember, you know, like I'm a former chief technology and information officer. So I ran a department of technology. Uh, We have technical project directors who work with our school IT leaders who are identified by the school district and helping them to build planning structures and things so that when they get LTE enabled devices from us, Um, They can roll them out uh, and get them to the students 
in a celebratory way. Mm -hmm. And so that's empowering a whole school to really do some really good things with that, um, to build professional learning within yes. the school district. Critical. And within the school, uh, we provide a coach to each one of those uh, Ville schools. And so that full-time coach uh, is working with the teachers and you know in the classrooms and helping them with innovative um, techniques and classroom practices that these teachers may not have had access to right. uh, in the past. And then of course, you know, the devices are probably one of the smallest things, right? Exactly. Uh, in that we provide iPads, Chromebooks, or hotspots, but that allows students to have access to the internet when they are not at school. So when they're at home, if they don't have the internet, you know, classroom teachers now can count on students having a device and having access to the internet so they can create these innovative lessons that, um, you know, use technology in ways maybe kids haven't used before right. um, to enhance their learning. And it also allows them to go deeper after yes. the four o'clock bell rings, right? You exactly. can go home and continue your work, whereas before when the bell rang, it was over. Right, and mm -hmm. so there's further exploration, further um, project-based work and additional learning uh, going on. So I really believe that this does make a difference in the lives of our students because it provides them so much more access. And um, you know, when a teacher can count on those students having that access, they can create lessons that, um, like you said, go deeper, allow right. for exploration and unleashing the passions within students to really, you know, follow their interests and desires and, and be creative and create things that, um, you know, that show what they're learning. Absolutely. You know, I have a question about that. I, when I do professional development, I often will do them for grants just like this. So not only are the devices deployed and given out, um, but it's done so, as you said, in a celebratory way and with ongoing support. And I help to provide that support uh, to the teachers in order to give them, um, you know, help them with creating the lessons, uh, coaching them, but then also pushing into the classroom and mentoring them as they implement it. Do you have what you mentioned, the coaching and the professional development? Is it ongoing like that? And what sorts of innovation um, is is uh, grown from this, is nurtured from this. Dwayne, what about, uh, how does that work? Yeah, so it, it works in, in multiple ways. So speaking to the same thing that Diane is talking about, you know, support, but we support mostly the, the school leaders and the school leadership teams. So how do we support them in thinking of how to one, uh, understand one, how to design, validate, champion, and scale innovative learning uh, opportunities to advance equity and excellence for all students. So looking at the change management piece for leaders to, to look at that. So within the league, uh, the great thing that I love about it, we're a very close-knit organization. Uh, we, we collaborate, uh, these leaders come together to collaborate on shared priorities and challenges that they see and developing best practices and what they're doing. So when we think of innovation, it could be utilizing something new, uh, but it also could be utilizing something old in a new way. Uh, so that's how we see it. And we're supporting and pushing the envelope um, for our students. Um, and ultimately, how do we you know, support uh, the research and development behind that approach? So we're just not talking about change management. We're also looking at the numbers, looking at the data, looking at the research to back what we're seeing when we share out these best practices for students. Uh, and some of those things for, for best practices, like we go from advocating for, for broadband, uh, universal broadband, all the way to building capacity for data equity, or even developing tools to improve secondary writing. Um, and, and that's kind of the work that we do within the League of Innovative Schools. I love it. Now, how do you get, do you, do you get um, third parties involved, um, internet companies? Um, do they get involved in this? How does this work? Because they need to be a part of this to help in providing the equity that is so desperately needed. Yeah, I think Diana speak to Verizon. So I know, you know, that's the big, big component. Like they're a huge supporter um, of, of Digital Promise. Uh, for us, when COVID first hit, uh, we immediately uh, noticed, uh, we assessed our school districts to see, you know, what the needs were. We did have a few school districts that needed hotspots, that needed devices. Um, so we reached out to a third party 
uh, uh, which was Kajit, which is now a corporate partner, and they were able to provide hotspots um, and LTE enabled devices to our school districts. Um, because at that time, you know, when COVID first hit, every district was in need of a hotspot. So it was a hot commodity, couldn't find them. But because we had a prior, uh, I had a prior uh, engagement with them, um, had worked with them before in my former uh, district that I worked for, uh, I knew the person immediately. Uh, so I was able to pick up the phone. Uh, so that way, Kajit was able to provide, you know, these districts with the hotspots, our LT enabled devices, and, you know, utilizing any, any service that they needed to meet the needs of their students. Uh, we, we've also had some districts that did some innovative work. Uh, we have some districts that were getting into, especially our rural districts, you know, building their own cell towers uh, to provide internet access because they, you know, they saw that this may not be the last pandemic. Um, they, we also had some district, uh, DC Everest out in, in the state of Washington, working with third party organization that were building these huge industrial side drones where they could attach hotspots on them and they could hover over the students' uh, areas in the rural areas where there was no broadband and providing them internet access. Whoa, so looking at innovative that. approaches that way, that's the work of the, of the league and, and Digital Promise. Now that's innovative. That's innovative. Yes. That is great. What are some of the goals of, of your League of Innovation? Do you have set goals that you work towards or? Yeah, we, we, we have some set goals. Uh, one, we want to design um, and create policies, programs, and tools uh, so that we can model. We want to validate. We want to make sure that we inform design and, and efficacy with research champion. We want to advocate policies and programming and models that transform, transform systems. We want to scale, so we want to share and drive a, adoption models uh, so that folks are able to see that. Uh, and then also looking at, you know, advancing equity. Uh, that's kind of where we're pivoting towards now. Uh, you know, how do we uh, promote equitable outcomes for historically underserved students? Um, and when you when we design at the margins, we design for everybody. So what does that look like? How do we ensure that uh, within the league, we also have uh, developed what we call the Inclusive Innovation Center uh, within the league uh, for digital promise. And this, um, this center is looking at how do we develop processes and procedures and tools for marginalized communities, not for, but with. So they're at the table providing input on what they need, not what someone else is thinking they need. So that's the kind of work that we're looking at, at doing. Those are some of our goals. Um, and ultimately we, we wanted to develop a, a, a network where we are actually providing league leaders opportunity to take the league. It's not me always developing programming, it's me listening to them and they're bringing their expertise and we're just supporting and pushing that programming out. So developing a thought process, thought leadership um, there with third party vendors and, you know, corporate partners in the mix. And you said you're a close knit group. So do your leaders get together and share ideas and share practices that are working and support each other too? Yeah, prior to COVID. <laughs> I think everyone's saying that prior to COVID. Prior to COVID, we had two convenings a year where we brought our school leaders together. And uh, these convenings were held in the spring and in the fall. Um, and what would happen is a league district or multiple league districts in that area would be the host of, of the convenings in the fall and in the spring. Uh, we would come together, do some programming, but also do some uh, site visits. So we were able to get out and see the innovation in the schools. So we had, you know, all of our district leaders coming together, plus our corporate partners going out to see what the needs are coming back together and, you know, developing, do some, you know, some um, best practice sharing and thought partnership on what are our priorities, you know, moving forward um, and some industry visits. Uh, so, so yes, it's, it's, we're super excited to get back to that. So hopefully in October this year will be our hybrid convening. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to hopefully see people face to face. Um, and, and get back together. Um, but other than that, we've been doing some virtual, a lot of virtual events for our, our league leaders, bringing them together and providing a lot of resources externally to non-league members uh, has been going on. Well, along the same lines, I have another question. Yeah. So you said before COVID, <laughs> now that we're, I don't think we're post COVID yet, but now that more schools are opening, 
do you have to look at some different things? Do you have some reopening ideas about what this should look like as schools are reopening? Yes, we uh, just released what we call our digital equity checklist um, that was released um, on our website. And, and this is looking at, it's just, this is a quick checklist of things that school districts um, inform school districts how uh, districts in the league have prepared to reopen schools in a hybrid and a distance learning environment uh, during COVID-19. Uh, and, and this just serves as a guide uh, to support districts in meeting uh, the need of every student and uh, to direct and focus on underserved resources for students. So this guide highlights you know, six primary categories uh, that uh, include and extend beyond providing uh, students with devices and internet access. And these six areas are, you know, devices and internet access, uh, communication and engagement, teaching and learning, uh, budget and op funding operations, uh, policy support and logistics and professional development. Um, we're now in the midst of developing a Reopen Strong webinar series, where we are gonna actually be looking at um, bringing on some league districts uh, to talk about how they're going to reopen strong. So we're looking at these kind of categories and areas and districts will be sharing up, you know, what they're looking forward to and some some actual uh, practices and actually policies that they have developed in their districts. Are those only open to Digital Promise members or can other people attend those? All of those webinar series for Reopen Strong will be external. So we're, we're going to be um, doing those external uh, to, to non-league members. So that has been our, our MO since COVID hit. Um, you know, really how do we, you know, the most innovative schools, you know, we're struggling, but there are a lot of districts that don't even have a close knit network to talk to. So how can we share our best practices and learnings to others? So kind of lift up the hood, if you will. So folks can kind of see, oh, there's a there's already a guide for this. Or, oh, this is what this district is doing. You know, that's the, that's the for me, I think that's the biggest support for districts is sharing, you know, developing that close knit network or even just hearing from someone to kind of bounce some ideas off. So we're also thinking of doing some design studios. Um, we've probably soon, we, we kicked it off actually with, with Bill's uh, earlier last year uh, where a few of the Bill uh, coaches and their executive director actually uh, worked with us with a few districts that needed support on thinking about online learning, hybrid learning. And we went through a design thinking process with them to answer any of their, their, their most pressing pain points in their districts. Yes. And you use the design thinking process? Yep, from start okay. to finish. We had some great podcasts about yeah. design thinking. Yeah. It's really hitting education right now. It's, it's so important. Yeah, it really fits into to anything, and especially when we're talking about innovation, for sure. Um, and and I, I love how you said, Dwayne, how you have your, your league members, but you're also working to um, expand outside of the league and share and share with everyone. Who, how do people become league members and what region, is there a particular region that you serve? To become a league member, there's an application process uh, that we just actually closed our application process. We're looking, we're in the midst right now of the second round of interviews, um, but to be a member, uh, when we open up our membership, uh, it normally opens in uh, mid-January and runs through probably March, April. Um, they get to apply um, and we're looking for districts uh, who are, you know, have done some innovative work, uh, have some definitions or policies or practices around innovation and equity. Uh, it doesn't have to be perfect, but, you know, how can you bring something to the table that we can help support and push farther or even share out with other league members? Um, so this year we, we uh, did uh, look to prioritize diversity, uh, diversifying the league member. So looking at, you know, the, you know, underrepresented uh, populations within the superintendencies like black and brown leaders, female leaders, uh, looking for districts that had 50% or more free reduced lunch rates um, to make sure that we're, we're diversifying our membership organization and, and having a healthy, vibrant network. And this is nationwide. This is nationwide. This is nationwide. We uh, something that we we don't we don't talk about really is digital promise is no longer digital promise. We are digital promise global. So we are thinking about what does digital promise look like crossing over the border. So um, we're definitely looking at you know what does digital you know League of Innovative Schools global will look like. 
um, and then where we're going to start. Uh, and that's coming soon. A lot of that information is coming soon. That's wonderful. I mean, it, we are a complete world globally. There are so many different uh, perspectives and innovation and ideas. So being able to collaborate in that way, I'm sure is only going to elevate everyone. Jamie, I'll, I'll say this, and I'm sure Diane can share too. When we put on webinars externally, we were shocked when we first did it. We saw people from Africa. We saw people from the UK. We saw people from Asia. And I mean, it, it floored us to see like there is a need for innovation. There's a need uh, like people want to get together and talk about best practices because, you know, what we're dealing with here is just not a U.S. thing. It's, it's a worldwide thing. Equity and, and, and innovation is a worldwide thing. So, Diane, when you're getting ready for your schools to go back, what kinds of things are you looking at? Yeah, well, and any person in the field of technology for schools would say this is the busiest time of the yes. season. Yeah. Um, we have had particular um, you know, differences this year in that the devices that students have had at home have been at home for a while. Yes. Um, and so yeah. we found that, you know, most school districts, as they should, are collecting those devices. Maybe even devices that were quickly taken out of a laptop cart <laughs> and right. sent home with students. Right. Now they're trying to get all that stuff back. What's working? What isn't working? What didn't come back at all? Where are the parts? How are we going to fix this? Are we going to buy new stuff with the, um, the funds that are coming in? Is there still a global demand shortage on parts? Yes, there is. Are shipping mm -hmm. lanes and, and cargo um, freight still in, you know, in high demand? Yes. So there are so many things that ed tech IT leaders are having to think about at this time. Right. On top of the typical things about, you know, um, do our school secretaries have their upgraded desktop computers and their systems? And what does interoperability look like? And those types of things. So um, we know that our school district IT leaders have a lot on their plate. And so as we talk about innovation and what we offer, I talked about what takes place in the classroom. But also, um, we also provide support to IT leaders so that mm -hmm they can develop systems for rollout, for um, device support and repair, and all those types of things, so that once the technology gets to the students, you know, if something gets broken, do the students know what to do? Is digital citizenship being taught in the classroom? Um, you know, what, what is the role of a technology coach? And what does the IT support do and what does a coach do? A coach should sure. only be doing instructional things. Right. IT should be doing IT. Keep the hot side hot and the cold side cold, right? <laughs> so we've got a lot of those things that we help leaders build uh, as we move forward with the systems. Yeah, I, I agree, Diane. Um, we we are taking those same you know pointers from, from uh, the Ville side. And we're working with leaders uh, heavily with sustainability. What does this look like? You know, we have these immersive amount of funds coming in now. Like some, I, you know, a lot of us will say this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Like, how do you sustain this? What does this look like five years from now? So, you know, are you purchasing devices or are you leasing devices? Uh, you know, that that's an option. But also the other big elephant in the room that we've noticed our, a lot of our district leaders are, are right now struggling with is data privacy. Like everything now is online. When COVID hit, everybody was offering something free. Uh, but where is your data going? <laughs> like that's that's a big thing that that's staring us down, you know, down in our eyes. That you know, are we thinking of that? And that's a lot of like what Diane says. Like your IT uh, and technology leaders in the district is, you know, they can't sleep at night because they're worrying about the sustainability model. They're worrying about data privacy and keeping your information safe. But also, um, with everyone being home like a lot of our districts, and I know a lot of Ville districts, they had to now, how do we support devices at home and how do we support parents? So we have a lot of districts that's developing parent universities because we're, we're teaching not just the student, we're teaching the whole family how to help support their kid at home. 
Um, how to get on this application, how to do that. So, you know, streamlining all of that stuff, coming into one, you know, one, one stop shop, a lot of districts have been doing. Um, and ultimately, you know, the other piece is, you know, how do we reach the most marginalized kids? And this is something that the league has been, you know, taught in talking about and getting our district leaders to talk about. Uh, if the kid doesn't have internet access or doesn't have cell phone service, how are you going to reach them? So, you know, where are the places that you can reach them? Where are they going? They go to public libraries. They go to public barbershops. They may go to boys and girls club. So now districts are now having to now reach out beyond their normal uh, uh, perimeters, uh, if you will. Um, and a lot of our district leaders have become like the main hub of information when COVID hit. So it's, it's a lot of pressure on them, but it also it has now privy them to another aspect or another realm of communication and transparency. Yeah, and, and I, I can see then also that they're really working to make connections with the community to provide for uh, those opportunities for those youngsters who don't have those that access. So reaching out to barbershops, making partnerships with the community. And in the end, it really ends up making everyone stronger. So uh, I think it's, a, it's a, an important uh, and sustainable uh, initiative in that way as well. What are some of the trends that you both are seeing? Now, Dwayne, you mentioned the checklist that you have in place. Um, are, are they helping school leaders to, you know, to get back to school and look at also how they're going to be spending the, that money in a sustainable way? What trends are you seeing and what support have you uh, seen being leveraged? Yeah, this checklist is just a thought process to make you be a thought provoking process to think about, are you really, you know, designing at the margins for our students. So really looking at, you know, not only just, you know, device access, you know, planning, you know, giving students the max amount of internet data, like, if you can go unlimited, that's where you need to go. <laughs> because, you know, if a kid is on zoom, and doing, you know, utilizing Desmos and, you know, got, you know, Google or Word, Microsoft up, like that's a lot of bandwidth all at once. And once it's over, then what? Like, then the kid can't learn. So how do we, you know, make sure we're looking at those processes, processes but also looking at the filtering and simple compliance. Uh, then we're looking at, you know, this, this checklist also talks about how do we survey and engage community stakeholders, you know, through all of the processes? How do we meet, you know, those parents who, who may not be, you know, you know, parents, they may be caregivers, you know, what does the on demand portal look like? How do parents reach out and get support? Is there a one stop shop where they can drive and, you know, drop off a device and get another, uh, you know, a lot of that, a lot of that information is, is, is in that checklist. A lot of the trends that we're seeing, and, and I'm going to talk and I'm going to let Diane talk too, because I'm sure we're seeing the same trends. Um, a lot of districts are really thinking about once I reopen, what if I have to go back hybrid? So a lot of districts are developing hybrid uh, virtual academies um, for their school districts. Like they're hiring assistant principals and teachers for virtual academies now um, because there are a large group of students um, who cannot take the COVID vaccine, who you know may have some, some um, you know, uh, leering of, of about going back to school because we do have some parents who are uh, who do have generational housing like they live with grandma grandpa who cannot may not have a you know pre-existing condition that they cannot take the COVID vaccine and they don't want to bring that back home to grandma grandpa so they want to stay virtual also another thing that we, we're hearing a lot about we've heard this word about learning loss learning loss learning loss I will tell you there's been a lot of learning going on <laughs> during this time um, so, you know, and there are a lot of students that have thrived under this virtual model. Uh, I have three kids and, and my son, my young, my middle child has thrived uh, A's and B's um, because of this virtual model, because he's able to utilize different aspects and it has streamlined him um, to be able to get, you know, get exactly to where he needs to be and go exactly where he needs to go and not have the extra uh, you know, other pieces going on. So we need to talk about that. So th those are some trends that are happening uh, within districts. Do you see that there'll be more hybrid learning in the future? Oh yeah, I think th this pandemic has been, well, as you know, Jerry and, and Diane and Jamie, this is something we've been talking about for years. <laughs> like it took a pandemic for people to realize like, 
oh, that thing you were talking about, <laughs> data and operability, now I understand what you're talking about. Oh, oh I get that innovation now. <laughs> exactly. I get that. We, we need a, you know, a single sign on. Oh, now I see why I need to fund that. So all of that is now you know, coming, you know, coming up in, in districts that were you know, doing this work already. They were above you know, and beyond uh, and, and could flip the switch quickly when, when the pandemic hit. Those that weren't, they immediately noticed that, oh, you know, I got to get on board. So um, I think now the question is not that everyone, not everyone has devices, but majority of kids in, in communities across this, this neighborhood, uh, across the United States have some type of device or access now. Now the question is, what do we do with it? What does professional development and training looks like? Are we preparing our teachers for this? Are we preparing our curriculum? Uh, when I was in DCPS, and when I came in, the first thing they told me, let's do a one-to-one -one initiative. It took me five years to get there because I immediately noticed that one, the professional development and training was not there. The staffing wasn't ready. Curriculum was not ready. So once we give them devices, what are they gonna do with it? Because it's not digitized. There was, you know, we had to look at LDAP and, you know, all this other stuff, get a single sign on, got to roll out a platform, productivity tools. And when you talk about all of that, there's a lot of professional development and training and change management and the changing of the evaluation system, because when principals go in and see these technology and they know they're nothing about it, teachers are going to get, you know, bad evaluation. So it's a lot more to this, you know, when, when you bring in a, a director of technology or CTO or whatever, it's a lot more that we are dependent on that needs to happen beyond our scope of just technology. Yeah, you, you know, you, you're supporting the leadership and that is so important because when they go into the classroom, they know what to expect and, and, and see. Um, and then on you know, the teacher side, the teachers, of course, you have the teachers who have been teaching in innovative ways using blended learning or flipped classroom model already. And so you know, that technology is just enhancing what they already do. But then there has to be you know, that change management, that shift in instructional practices in order to truly um, you know, use that technology in the best ways. Um, and not just, you know, a substitution model. So um, there's just all around so much that, um, so many mind shifts that need to take place in order for it to really come uh, together for the kids in the best possible way. And sure. there's so many pieces that have to go in it. Like, for example, you know, I'm just going to say it, ClassLink. <laughs> like, you got to have a platform that could house everything in one place seamlessly, like a lot of districts didn't know anything about this, but they learned about it quickly because they immediately saw that, you know, kids didn't know what to do, where to go, how to get there, got to learn this password, this, like, that's a lot of stuff. It's a lot of pieces that go into this. It's not just a, you know, a lot of people think, oh, we just pass our devices and that's it. No, it's, it's, it's a long process. It is. And just like you said, it has to be seamless. There has to be, you know, a, a path that everyone um, is is knowing and on the same page with in order to just get to their tools. And then, of course, beyond that is how to use them um, in, in innovative and effective ways, for but sure. A lot about the cognitive load and the brain research that goes into that, that if you are totally exhausting your short-term memory, just trying to find your stuff, you don't yeah, have right, to exactly. So we want to- Sounds like my every day in, uh, around my house, but yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, as we wrap up today, we always like to ask you, what are some tech tools or even books or something that you would suggest to educators to, to be thinking about? Things that you found really- helpful or useful to you as you move forward? Well, I would like to bring up that we have uh, just released a sustainability toolkit. Oh. And it's for planning what to do with all this funding coming in um, as oh COVID relief funding, because here's what could happen. Money comes in for three years, your school district is buying, buying, buying stuff. But then if you haven't thought about all the resources that it takes to keep and man maintain the yes. equipment and the things that you're getting when your funding ends in three years, you're really gonna be right. hurt because yeah. devices, you won't have money for device repair. You may not be able to afford the personnel for device mm -hmm. repair. And so there are things that you can do now 
that school districts could do now and invest in now that will help them for the future. For instance, you know, uh, taking a look and buying things that give you backside analytics for when applications are being used, how often uh, they're being used and things like that. So that when you have to make tough decisions three years down the road as to what apps yes. you need to cut, There's you data can- Data to support it. Data, right. Mm -hmm. And so sustainability is a very important thing that we all need to think about and that planning should start now before the funding hits the school district. Yeah, before you start using it away, make sure you're using it so that it's being sustained. Absolutely. Right. And, and yeah, don't is this buy it. available? Can you get this tool somewhere? Yes, if you go to the Digital Promise website and type in um, sustainability toolkit, you will be able to find uh, multiple tiles that talk about everything from assessing what you have, what your educational needs are, all the way to vetting and, and separate considerations that it takes regarding yes. the total cost of ownership of things. Mm -hmm. It's so, so it, important and we'll make sure that we have this linked in our, yes. um, with our podcast. Yeah, free tool, that's yes. great, that's great. Dwayne, do you have anything that, um, and it could be personal too, uh, a favorite tech tool, something you're reading, something you want to share? Yeah, I, I will say uh, same thing as Diane, uh, the digital equity guide checklist that we develop, uh, very important, you know, to think about how do you design at the margins to support the most marginal high school. It's on our digital promise website. It's the look up digital, digital uh, promise checklist. Um, actually, I think we, you know, when I looked at the, the, the bills one, I was like, we should have written this together. <laughs> 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 but we'll definitely make sure we get those links to you. Um, I will say for me, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm reading Grading for Equity uh, by, by Dan, uh, I think his name is Feldman. Um, and it's a pretty good book. You know, how do we address, you know, the equity um, in, in all of the aspects of grading and assessments for kids, uh, things that we were doing wrong. I even read things like when I was a teacher, like, oh, my God, I did that. <laughs> so, you know, making sure that, you know, we learn better and we do better. Um, ultimately, for me, you know, moving forward with the league is, you know, how do we provide, you know, equitable opportunities for students? And my mantra, my motto is do right by students and all that you do. So how do we ensure that the League of Innovative Schools and, you know, Digital Promise, we're promoting doing right by students in every aspect of the work that you do, even if you're a technology leader, the custodian, or even up to the principal. Everything that you do needs to be centered around doing right by students, not by you, not, not by developing a technology system that meets your needs. It's about meeting the needs of students. So those are my parting words, and I am so thankful for being here. Oh, um, oh that's a great hope note. to see you guys in person. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, thank you both for being here. And we have a couple of things that we have been doing that's new, and we hope that you can join us. First of all, we'll do a clubhouse. I don't know if you're both on clubhouse or not. Yes. But we have been doing clubhouse conversations around our podcast topics because we know we're not the only ones that have questions. And we have people from around the world that join our clubhouse. Awesome. And so we want you to join us when we talk about this. I th and Dwayne alluded to the fact that he had people from all over the world joining in. So we will get that information to you and have you join us on that. Awesome. And then we're also, Jamie, you wanna talk about some of the PD things that yeah. are starting to develop? Yeah, so we take, you know, Jerry and I are floored every week when we get to talk to amazing people just like the two of you. And what we have noticed is you know, very um, distinct themes that come out of our podcast. So we have organized our podcast into themes and we are offering these in a sort of choice board. And then therefore, if you um, are able to engage in these podcasts, and share your takeaways, then we provide CEUs for you. So we hope that um, you all can leverage that. If you're listening to us or watching us, you may as well get credit for it. So um, we're gonna we're organizing those into themes so it's easy for you to, to get, right, for the credit. So uh, we're really excited about that and um, I hope that you all take advantage of that. And back to our clubhouses, uh, they're always the Wednesday, uh, every Wednesday at 9 p.m. Eastern. Um, 
And uh, we have people from Australia joining us in the middle of their day. And it's always a really great conversation. We get to meet new people every week. And so Diana Duane, we're excited to uh, have you on uh, next Wednesday. So that'll be fantastic. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, we want to say thank you to both of our guests today. And thank you for the work that you're doing to try to close this gap. It's very difficult work. And like you said, the technical piece is the easy part, it right? Is. You are it's so the right. Adaptive work that is so difficult. And so thank you for taking it on and, and sharing it with the world. So important. So it was great to spend time with both of you. And thank you for being a part of Linked Up, Breaking Boundaries with Education. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And if you would like to stay linked up, be sure to follow us on Apple and Spotify and subscribe to us on YouTube.